Welcome to the first video lecture in this course. We're going to start this course by a brief discussion of natural logarithm. As you may remember, in Calc 1 you finished the second part with a lot of discussion about integration. In one of the key formulas, in order to integrate, for instance, polynomial functions, was the so-called power rule for integration that states that if you integrate a power of the variable, of the form x to the n, you obtain an antiderivative by raising the power by 1 and then dividing by this uh, n plus 1. So this is true for every n, except that, as you can see in this formula, we divide by n plus 1. That means we implicitly assume that n is not negative 1, because of course we cannot divide by 0. So what if we want the antiderivative of x to the negative 1, in other words, the antiderivative of 1 over x? We know that 1 over x is a continuous function as long as we are on an interval that does not contain 0. And since every continuous function has an antiderivative on an interval where it's continuous, that means that we know that uh, an antiderivative of 1 over x makes sense as long as we restrict ourselves either to the interval 0 infinity or to the interval negative infinity 0. Well, the natural logarithm function by definition is one particular antiderivative of 1 over x, namely it is given by the integral from 1 to x of 1 over t dt. In this definition, we assume that x is positive. In other words, we are looking at an antiderivative of 1 over x on the interval 0 infinity, on the positive rates. So what can we say about uh, this logarithmic function? Well, because of the way it is defined, if you recall the fundamental theorem of calculus that you have seen in calculus 1, it states that if you have a continuous function on a certain interval and you look at the integral from a to x of f of t dt where the interval ax is included in the interval of continuity, that defines a function of x. If you differentiate it with respect to x, the derivative is simply what you obtain by plugging the upper bound x inside the function f, you obtain f of x. You see that ln of x is defined exactly that way as the integral from a constant, in this case 1, to x of a continuous function. As long as we pick x uh, positive, then we can make sure that uh, on the interval 1x, 1 over t is continuous. And therefore, the fundamental theorem of calculus applies to the effect that the derivative of ln of x is the value of 1 over t at x, in other words, 1 over x and this is for positive x. You see that in particular, because x is positive, 1 over x is as well. In other words, ln of x has a positive derivative on its domain, which is all the positive reals, and it is therefore an increasing function. Another obvious uh, consequence from the definition is that here we integrate from 1 to x, so in particular, if we integrate from 1 to 1, the case where x is 1, well, as you know, integral from a to a is always 0, right? If you're integrating on an interval of width 0, uh, the integral is 0, and therefore the natural log takes a value 0 at 1. Now, let's take a look at what that means graphically. This is the graph of y over x, or of uh, 1 over t, and you see that the value x equal 1 plays a particular role. Now let's say I pick an x that is greater than 1, like this, and then I look at uh, my ln of x, which by definition is integral from 1 to x of 1 over t. In other words, it is the area under the graph of 1 over t, or 1 over x, between x equal 1 and x. In other words, ln of x is given by this area. So this is a graphical interpretation for ln of x, and in particular you see that ln of x, in that case, when x is greater than 1, can be interpreted as an area and is therefore positive. 
it's not surprising because we have seen that the natural log takes a value 0 at 1 and is increasing, so for x greater than 1 we should expect a positive value. On the other hand, if x is between 0 and 1, on the other part of the domain of the function, right, x has to be positive to be in the domain, if it is smaller than 1, then you see that this area here is not really the integral from 1 to x of 1 over t, but rather the integral from x to 1 of 1 over t because x is less than 1. And therefore this is the opposite of the integral from 1 to x of 1 over t dt. In other words, it is the opposite of the natural log of x. That means that graphically in this case, when x is between 0 and 1, ln of x is the opposite of the area that is drawn on the picture. In particular, it's going to be negative. Again, not a surprise, because we know that the function is 0 at 1 and increasing on its domain. So before 1, it has to be less than 0 and therefore negative. Now in this particular video, we're going to focus on uh, certain properties of this function that we will call laws of logarithm. And here are the four laws that I want to focus on. Note that we assume that x and y are positive to make sure that they are both in the domain of the natural log function, and r is an arbitrary real number. The first law states that the log of a product is the sum of the logs, assuming, of course, that both uh, terms x and y are positive. How do we prove such a thing? Well, suppose that um, y is a positive constant. And look at the function ln of xy, where y again is a constant. If you differentiate this function, we have the natural log of xy, where y is a constant, and we know that the derivative of the natural log is 1 over x. So here I have a composite log of some function, so I'm going to use the chain rule, get the derivative of the log, 1 over x, evaluate it at xy, that's 1 over xy, and then I have to multiply by the derivative of the function inside, so the derivative with respect to x of xy, if y is a constant, is y. So the derivative of ln of xy is 1 over xy times y. The y term cancels out and we get 1 over x. In other words, the derivative of ln of xy is the same as the derivative of ln of x. That means ln of x and ln of xy are two anti derivatives of the same function 1 over x on the same interval 0 infinity. But we know that if we have two antiderivatives of the same function on the same interval, they can only differ by a constant. And therefore, ln of xy is equal to ln of x up to a constant c. What is this constant c? Well, let's plug x equal 1 in this. We obtain ln of 1 times y, that's ln of y, is equal to ln of 1, which we know is 0, plus c. In other words, c is just ln of y, and if I plug back c at the beginning of the line, I get ln of xy is ln of x plus ln of y. In other words, the formula I wanted to establish. Turning to the second uh, formula to establish, I want to establish that the natural log of 1 over y is the opposite of the natural log of y. And to see that, let's start with the fact that ln of 1 could be written as ln of y over y. Maybe that's a silly way to write it, but it will be useful for us. y over y, I can further write that as y multiplied by 1 over y, and then use what I just proved, the fact that log of a product is the sum of the logs. So I obtain ln of y plus ln of 1 over y. But ln of 1 is 0. Therefore, I have ln of y plus ln of 1 over y is 0, which means that ln of 1 over y is negative ln of y. Now, as an immediate consequence, we get the law number 3, which is that the natural log 
of a quotient is the difference of the logs. In other words, ln of x over y is ln of x minus ln of y. Because now, ln of x over y, it's the log of x multiplied by 1 over y. Using the first law, we obtain ln of x plus ln of 1 over y, which is negative ln of y by the second law. And therefore, we obtain ln of x minus ln of y. Turning to the fourth law, and here we are not going to be able to fully justify it, but more or less justify it. Uh, it says that if you take the natural log of a power of the variable, or of a power of an expression, then you can pull out that power in front. In other words, ln of x to the r is r multiplied by ln of x. Let's start with a simple case where r is 2. Then we are looking at ln of x squared. I can write that x times x and use the first law which gives me the natural log of a product. So natural log of x times x is natural log of x plus natural log of x. That's 2 ln of x. In other words, the formula number 4 works when r is 2. Well, I could take x cubed and say it's the log of x times x squared, and I would get ln of x plus log of x squared. Log of x squared is 2 ln of x, so I would get 3 ln of x, and it works again. And more generally, by induction, if n is a um, positive integer, you see that the formula works uh, for the first couple of uh, positive integers. And then if I assume that it works up to a certain point, let's say n minus 1, for the next n, uh, the natural log of x to the n is simply the natural log of x multiplied by x to the n minus 1. Using the formula 1 about the natural log of a product, we have the natural log of x plus natural log of x to the n minus 1, and assuming we've already verified for n minus 1, we can pull n minus 1 out, get the n of x plus n minus 1 ln of x, in other words, n times ln of x. So, if the power in the formula is a positive integer, everything checks out. If now this is a negative integer, if n is a negative integer, then of course its opposite is positive. So when I take ln of x to the n, I can write that as ln of 1 over x to the negative n, where negative n is actually positive. And then I know that ln of 1 over x to the negative n is the opposite of ln of x to the negative n. But negative n is positive, and I know that in this case I can pull out the exponent. So I get negative, negative n times ln of x, and that's just n ln of x. In other words, the formula still checks out whether I use a positive integer or a negative one. But integers are not all there is to numbers, and uh, we can turn to the next class of numbers, in particular rational numbers. So now the exponent is a quotient of two integers, where of course the denominator q is non-zero. And so we are looking at the log of x to the p over q, fraction of integers. That's really x to the 1 over q to the p, and since p is an integer, I can pull it out. And I get p times the natural log of x to the 1 over q. Remains to see what, what we can do with natural log of x to the 1 over q. And to see that, observe that ln of x, you can write that as ln of x to the 1, and write 1 as q over q. Pull out the q, just like we did before. You get that ln of x is q times ln of x to the 1 over q. Solving to for ln of x to the 1 over q, we get 1 over q ln of x. And we can substitute on the line above. And we obtain p over q ln of x. In other words, an exponent of the form p over q can be pulled out as well. Now to justify that it really works for any real number and not just any rational number, uh, it's a little bit more tricky, but we're going to... Uh, admit that we can extend this result from rational number to all real numbers. Now turning to some examples of what these formulas are for. Uh, let's start with a question like that. You want to expand 
the natural log of, in other words, rewrite uh, in a less compact way. We want to uh, expand the natural log of 3x squared divided by root of x plus 2. Recall that these are our formulas. The first observation is that you have the natural log of a quotient, and according to formula number 3, it's a difference of the log, so I get natural log of 3x squared minus natural log of root of x plus 2. For the first log of 3x squared, it's a log of a product, so I can use the first formula, and I obtain the sum of the logs, in other words, log of 3 plus log of x squared. And I leave the uh, last term unchanged, except that I write root of x plus 2 as x plus 2 to the 1 half. And this way I can use the law number 4, that tells me that when I have log of a power, I can pull out that power, I can apply that to ln of x squared, so it gives me 2 ln of x, and also to ln of x plus 2 to the 1 half, it gives me 1 half ln of x plus 2. Notice that we have a formula for the log of a product, but not for the log of a sum, so there's nothing I can do with ln of x plus 2. Now going the other way, let's say we want to uh, rewrite a certain expression as a single logarithm. So here, for instance, we have ln of 3 plus 1 third ln of 8, and we want to write that as a single logarithm. We can use formula number 4 to pull the power, I'm sorry, to pull the constant in front of ln of 8 inside the log as a power and get ln of 8 to the 1 third. So we use formula number 4 backward. 8 to the 1 third is the cubic root of 8, it's 2. Therefore, we get ln of 3 plus ln of 2. Now we have a sum of logs, which according to the first law, is the log of the product. So it is ln of 3 multiplied by 2, in other words, ln of 6. So now we have our expression as a single log. Similarly, if we wanted to express as a single log the expression ln of x plus a times ln of y minus b ln of z, we could use the formula number 4 to bring in the multiplic multiplicative constants a and b as powers. So we get ln of x plus ln of y to the a minus ln of z to the b. And then use the laws 1 and 3 about uh, sum of logs or difference of logs. A sum gives you log of a product, a difference gives you log of a quotient, and therefore, applying these laws, we get the log of x times y to the a divided by z to the b. Now, we're going to see more about this natural log function in the next video.